Welcome to The Natural Health Revolution, a weekly podcast that focuses on bringing science and nature together by bringing you the top experts from the fields of science, health, nutrition, and well-being. We are Circle of Light, bringing you wholesome, all-natural ingredients to help you on your journey to long-term well-being. Take care of your gut health with our delicious Fibre 89 soluble drinks. Reap the nutritious, natural benefits of the unroasted green coffee bean with our unique green coffee range. And restore your body with our all-natural herbal night drink, Triple Z. Choose health the natural way. I'm Dr. Sarah Kelly, CEO of Circle of Light. Join us as we dig into all things health and find some inspiration along the way. Today, we are going to talk about pelvic health, a subject that sounds vaguely familiar to many, I'm sure. But if I am right, only the ears of a small section of our audience will have perked up. It is not a subject that is only relevant to pre, postnatal and menopausal women. It can be relevant for girls of all ages. And wait for it, it can be a pertinent issue for men of any age too. If you have suffered postnatally or an injury or illness has had an impact on continence, our guest, the brilliant Helen Keeble, will be able to enlighten you to the idea of pelvic repair and resilience. I hope you will come away today understanding a little more about what pelvic health actually means. Most importantly, issues related to pelvic health are not unsolvable conditions. We'll talk a little bit more on that and offer some tips on how you can improve your pelvic health. But first, I want to introduce the woman in question, Helen Keeble, a physiotherapist specialising in pelvic health and an invaluable independent advisor to us here at Circle of Light. At the Blackrock Clinic, she provides assessment and care for both men and women. She is one of the forces behind UMI Health, an online platform that was born from a passion to provide a dedicated resource for women to better understand, manage and improve their pelvic health. Helen, hi. Thank you for coming to talk to us today. Hi, thanks for having me. I suppose we should start from scratch. So tell me, what do you mean when you use the term pelvic health? So the term pelvic health is quite broad, I guess, but it basically applies to the health of the middle of your body. So anything in and around your pelvis. So it can mean your groin, your tailbone, your pubic bone. It can mean so any of the joints there. But then more commonly, I guess people would know it to mean anything about their bladder or their bowels or their uterus if they're female. Um, and just kind of how all that area kind of works together, basically. Also, of course, for women, it can mean about your gynecological health. So anything in terms of menstrual health or periods related, pregnancy, menopause anything like that so there in those time in our lives that is quite a keystone to kind of real nail on the pelvic health button basically okay it really encompasses a lot a lot yeah Yeah. I suppose people probably jump to the conclusion that it just means pelvic floor maybe that's speaking as a female but it really is so much more than that Definitely. And I think, and I'm definitely guilty as well of interchanging those terms. You know, you kind of would say pelvic health meaning pelvic floor or vice versa. So tell me, what does a pelvic health physio do and what can they help with? We do loads. Basically, we help with the functions of the pelvis. So like, that's what I love about my job, really. It's so varied. So I can like help with bowel health in terms of any constipation or rushing to the toilet in time or pain or leaking. I can help with sexual health. So in terms of like any pain or trouble with intercourse um, or penetration for example from a tampon or using a menstrual cup Um, I help with bladder stuff so again similar to bowel but in terms of getting to the toilet in time or leaking or going too often waking in the night because of your bladder I help with pregnancy stuff with postnatal recovery with menopause stuff with pains such as like groin pain hip pain low back pain pelvic pain like loads really abdominal stuff as well digestive health And a lot of what you've mentioned there, I I guess the first thing that comes into mind is their conditions or their issues that there might be embarrassment, you know, associated with them. So do you find that what you do, you know, certain concerns or issues people might have, that there's a little bit of a taboo about what you do? Yeah, definitely. Um, And I I have to just remind myself, you know, when I'm with my patients or clients that although to me, I find it easy to talk about these things because I talk about it every day, multiple times a day, you know, for them, it is a big deal. And I do really appreciate that kind of like reaching out even that first step or even to keep coming back and keep talking about things like it isn't easy for most people and it is harder to talk about these things with our friends with our family with 
even with a healthcare professional, you know, I think people still are a bit embarrassed. And then because of that natural hesitation, sometimes not everybody, of course, I do meet some people who are happy to talk about it all. Yeah, and I can totally relate. And funny, I have noticed that an enormous difference in, I suppose, the manner and openness in which my friends and family now speak to me about things like um, bowel movements and toilet habits. And it's because I guess since launching Fibre 89, that is something that I've been so tuned into. So I'm speaking really openly and casually about it. Like I'm just kind of, yeah, it's really important. And there's so much help out there. And there's so many things we can do that can improve these situations, sort of smash that taboo and get rid of it. We really should be. And I suppose these conversations sometimes talking about constipation and it can make people a little bit squeamish. But I suppose that's our responsibility, isn't it? To normalize that conversation. This is it, exactly. And at the end of the day, you know, it's just normal bodily functions. And I think even with like periods or constipation, like they're two really kind of obvious examples that I can think of, you know, that you just don't talk about. And the fact is everybody poos, you know, most women have periods, still such a big, big thing in society that we're made to be secretive about it and to like cover it up. And, you know, if you're going for a poo, no one must hear you, smell you, see you, you know, like and like, it must like eradicate its existence from happening. And actually we all poo, you know, like it shouldn't be such a taboo. Completely. And it's something I swear I've quoted to you so many times <laughs> on the statistic and I did not know this honestly until I met you where you told me that constipation can be as damaging for the pelvic floor as childbirth and when I first met you in the gym I was eight weeks pregnant and I really wanted to continue doing what I was doing so you told me stuff that I'd never heard before for someone who's been in the exercise physiology space for so long to never have heard this information you know and if it's hard for me to find this information how hard is it for other people yeah yeah I think being really fit and healthy in terms of exercise point of view in pregnancy is still quite a new concept too um but there was a new research paper out actually last year um by the exercise and pregnancy group and they're in Canada but they were basically looking at the conjugations of exercise and pregnancy and the precautions so the reasons why you might not be able to exercise if you're pregnant and they basically really reduced the list so there was only something like eight, I think it was in the end, of real reasons why you can't exercise if you're pregnant. But for most people, so for 99% of all pregnancies, it's completely safe to exercise and actually really necessary and really beneficial. The main things really to look out for from a pelvic health point of view would be the obvious things such as any leaking or pain or heaviness or bulging. Like in a nutshell, anything that doesn't quite feel normal to you. And when you say heaviness, I suppose for people who aren't like, you mean down below if you feel that yeah. yeah so any kind of vaginal heaviness around the back mm -hmm. passage or anything like that so the pelvic floor muscles basically sit from our pubic bone at the front of the pelvis round to the tailbone at the back so they encompass all of our holes basically so the urethra the vagina and the back passage if you have any discomfort heaviness any leaking from those holes that aren't meant to be leaking you know then that could be a sign your pelvic floor is just under a bit more strain and obviously in pregnancy the pelvic floor becomes under a bit more strain because of the growth pregnancy and you know it's completely normal of course to to gain weight during pregnancy so even when we're not exercising the pelvic floor does have a bit more to do and then when we're exercising it then has a bit more again to do mm -hmm. But that's okay because also being generally fit and active and exercising really helps the pelvic floor too. So we have to do our daily pelvic floor squeezes in pregnancy. And then by being physically fit and active and doing whatever it is that you enjoy doing, you don't have to do CrossFit, you can yeah. do whatever it is that tickles your fancy, but and that I will just help. Just pick up on something you said there, if you experience any of those symptoms, you know, so for example, if you're someone who enjoys high intensity exercise and you're experiencing those symptoms, it's not okay you need to stop exercising maybe just scale it a little bit yeah you're kind of looking for your threshold sure. and that might vary from day to day as well so you know at the end of the day you might be a bit less able than at the start of the day or you know your endurance might not quite be there or like I would never say okay you have to cut that out I would say okay let's like let's look at that and now let's modify that slightly to see how we can keep it in if you want to keep it in to your exercise routine but just how we can modify it to maybe either do it in a way that creates less pressure on your pelvic floor or do a few less reps or break it up a bit or you know like you can basically do any exercise that you want to do mm -hmm. it just might be 
you know, we have to modify a little bit. Yeah, and I think that was something as well. I always loved that attitude. Like you never said to a female, you know, once you have children, you're not able to do this anymore. You're never going to be no. able to do box jumps. You're never going to be able to have that high intensity impact no. training anymore. Whereas I have heard that message, you know, being sort of spread throughout, um, particularly around people who are maybe postnatal, you know, in those early stages postnatally, which is, abs- I think, whenever you are um, going back, and I suppose you would have given me great advice, you know, whenever I was going back, I suppose, which postnatally, I think I went to you for my six week check. Yeah. And one of the things that I thought was fantastic is obviously you can compiled a report, but you, with my permission, shared that with a postnatal exercise specialist. So it was Emma Dowling, so probably more commonly known as Empowered Mama on Instagram. But I loved that you shared that report with Emma. You explained to her where I was at. You had, you know, done the different assessments. So you knew sort of what I just needed to obviously, you know, slowly and gradually get back into exercise. But I think even something that stood out to me, you know, I wasn't at the stage, you would have said, again, just take a box jumps, but you give an alternative. So I was to start off, I think was heel drops. And then from there, you know, and little things like that, that sort of it meant I was still doing something and I knew I was on the right track on my way back to becoming, you know, active and highly active. And I guess you don't see a lot of that in healthcare where you have a specialist communicating with an exercise specialist. And for me, I, that was the first time I'd seen it firsthand and I thought it was fantastic. Yeah. And to be honest, that's the way I'd like I love to treat like I love working. And I think, well, like coaches and exercise professionals like I think we are a match made in heaven when it comes to physios and those you know like I think we can work really well and also I realized that people who have had a baby still don't know about pelvic health physio so you know if I was a lady who didn't know about physio and I just wanted to you know get fitter and stronger and feel a bit more healthy again then my first port of call might be an exercise instructor or an exercise professional um so I think it's just really great to kind of work together with those people and then you know it's just gonna only do good for the people coming to see us or either of us and just kind of work together yeah completely and even like when you say that you're right and it took me I went through my first pregnancy without realizing that you existed or that pelvic health (laughs) physios existed and I went after my second sort of I didn't have any issues or I didn't know if I had issues but I just heard I was like hold on what is this pelvic health therapy or pelvic floor therapy and I looked up a pelvic health physio and I sort of arrived and I'm laughing like she looked at me I arrived 10 days postpartum and she kind of said people don't normally come until six weeks and I said (laughs) I didn't know that like I just knew there was something called pelvic floor therapy and I was just after having a baby and I wanted to set myself up you know in the to be prepared for when I do return to exercise she you know she called me back at six weeks postpartum and she did a full assessment and funny after I had um my second child I did I felt like I could nearly go back to the gym straight away so that conversation 10 days postpartum was so important for me because she explained yeah you might feel okay but she just explained really simply how important that it is not to rush back and even people who are really fit I know elite athletes who are chomping at the bit you know as soon as they feel that they're able and ready to go back would you be able to suppose simply explain maybe why that recovery period is so important even if you do feel that you're ready why it's so so important to wait at least those six weeks yeah and it's something I see so often and I kind of felt it myself as well where your brain and body aren't really kind of on the same path yet and as you say like you feel like really ready to but your body just might not be quite there yet but essentially you know when we have um, a baby whether it's via c-section or vaginal birth then like our uterus internally has to heal so the bleeding that we have after having a baby is where the wound where the placenta was where that's come away is healing again that's kind of just one small thing in the relative scheme of things of what's going on so you've got an internal wound that's trying to heal you've got your muscles and ligaments and fascia and everything else trying to shrink back down again so like your abdominal muscles your tummy muscles um your pelvic floor you know these things have to like recoil and shrink back down again so basically if we're doing too much so anything that's more than kind of a walk or kind of lifting and holding and carrying the baby around then it can delay the healing of that wound but it can also delay the healing of the tissues coming back down together and then for some people if you have had a c-section or a vaginal birth and you've had some stitches then they all need to heal as well you know either the c-section scar or the pelvic floor scar or whatever's going on they need to heal and it's mother nature's timetable that it takes 
six weeks for soft tissues to heal. And as of yet, there's nothing that we know of that can actually speed up the healing process. Like you can rest well and well, I was going to say sleep, obviously that's not really on the cards <laughs> with a baby, but you know, you can rest well, you can eat well, and those things will enhance recovery, but nothing as yet actually speeds it up. But there are lots of things we can do to slow it down. So if we're smoking or not eating well or doing too much, then those things will slow recovery down. So, you know, you kind of see these hashtags that are like, you know, slow is fast. But as cheesy as they are, like there, there is some truth behind them. And as you say, if you're an elite Olympic athlete or you're just someone who loves going to the gym or just working out at home or whatever it is that you do, everybody needs those first few weeks for things to heal back down together. Yeah. And something she told me was that you might feel OK now, but if you don't look after your pelvic floor now at this stage in your life, you will regret it when I hit menopause. And that sat with me and I was like, OK. And that for me was, OK, it's really important for me to look after my pelvic floor at this stage in life. And like I had thought that I, you know, my abs were, I didn't realise it was only until I had someone who was very experienced checking. It was someone who really knew this space and she was able to tell me that I still had a significant separation. And what she told me, I didn't really understand the relevance of the pelvic floor for bringing your abs back together after yeah. pregnancy. Yeah, yeah, they're really, really linked. Um, so if I have somebody come to me and their main concern is their tummy muscles, then often they're surprised when I say, oh, okay, I'll check your pelvic floor first. And they're a bit like, what? Um, but they are so, so linked because, well, you get what's called a co-contraction. So if you're squeezing your pelvic floor well, if you're doing that Kegel correctly, so that squeeze and lift and that full let go again, it automatically will get your deepest tummy muscle to also squeeze. So you don't have to think about your tummy muscles doing it. It should automatically do it. Vice versa, it isn't always true. So I see a lot of women who love Pilates, for example, and sometimes they will kind of really try to target or overtrain this deep tummy muscle, this transverse abdominus. And sometimes that can mean it's to the detriment of their pelvic floor. So sometimes if your tummy muscles are trained too much relative to the pelvic floor, then that can be detrimental to the pelvic floor. So is that that it's putting pressure down in your pelvic floor? Yeah. yeah, exactly that. It's just increasing the intra-abdominal pressure. And then that over a long period of time, a bit like constipation in the same way, then can just weaken the pelvic floor. Can you, maybe for people who are listening, maybe that don't really understand what you mean by intra-abdominal pressure, can you explain that the, uh, the core, you know, that almost the cylinder, even just to paint that picture? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So the, and it's a, actually a really crucial point because often the core gets spoken about as the abs. So people will come in and say, I've been doing so much core work and nothing's changing and I'll get them to show me what they're doing and it's always they're doing like crunches or variations of that or like leg lifts or you know something like that. A common misconception among a lot of people is that they think their core is merely referring to their abs. The core is so much more than the abs so it's like this three-dimensional cylinder in the middle of our body. So kind of the pelvis sits at the bottom of the core and then the lid is the diaphragm. So around the bottom of the rib cage, basically. So between the bottom of the rib cage and the pelvis is the core. The diaphragm is the lid, the pelvic floor muscles are the bottom and then wrapping around the sides is the tummy muscle, the deeper tummy muscle and the back muscles. So when we say about intra-abdominal pressure, it just means the pressure within that abdominal space basically, and the core cylinder, so those four muscles, the diaphragm, pelvic floor, tummy and back, those four muscles house the intra-abdominal pressure, as well as organs and stuff, you know. But Yeah. So again, if you're increasing the pressure from the abdominal muscles, then you're, you're forcing that pressure downwards. This is it. And that's why, you know, a really easy thing in theory to change to help our pelvic floor is to never suck your tummy in. And again, I'll say Pilates, it's really common with the ladies mm -hmm, I see course, yeah. who love Pilates. And Pilates is not all bad, but it's just a very common thing I see that they have been taught to kind of constantly pull their tummy in because they think it's either like good for their back or they think it's good for their posture or they think it's good for their strength or whatever reason it is. Like, of course, they think they're doing good, but actually constantly pulling the tummy in increases that pressure and then pushes down on the pelvic floor. Like it's a, the core cylinder relatively is a closed space. Yes. So if you're sucking in like at the front and reducing the space there, it's just going to push down because 
we're upright, gravity is taking place, um, and it's just going to bulge down onto the pelvic floor more often than not. So all connected. And so is the breathing, you know, like how we breathe can then also either help or hinder the pelvic floor too. It's simple stuff, but it's just so connected, you know, and it's kind of, I just wish the information was out there for women. Well, for, for girls and boys, you know, it should be in schools, not when we get to kind of our age. And I um, absolutely and love, and I've heard you say this a few times, that you would love to develop a module or this yeah. information should be available in schools. And is there, like, why? Why is this information? And like I said, being an exercise scientist, I it blew my mind that it took me until my third pregnancy to get the information that I felt, you know, like helped me throughout in my pregnancy and helped me throughout in terms of looking after my pelvic health. But for me, if it was that difficult for me, I just think, how do people who maybe aren't as familiar with that space, like, why is that? It's a really good question. Relatively recently, yes. um, so the NICE guidelines, which are based in the UK, although they are followed here in Ireland too, they announced that they're going to start teaching um, pelvic floor education to girls as young as 12. Through the school system? Through the school system, okay. yeah, yeah. And I kind of think that's a great step forward. It would be great for boys to know as well because yeah. boys have a pelvic floor, but then also if boys live with girls, you know, like it's... Totally. They, everyone needs yeah. to know. It's, so many boys train, you know, so many men train women. And I think that sometimes they believe maybe they're doing... Uh, you know, they're being supportive of women by treating a pregnant woman the way they treat the lady standing beside her. Whereas there's very, you know, there's nuances with training when you're pregnant that you need to know. You still absolutely can be part of a class, but there's certain adjustments and modifications that will need to be made. So it's really important, yeah, for men to understand this. Definitely. And I wonder if that feeds into part of that embarrassment or that difficulty talking about it as well because when I was at primary school like we were kind of given a bit of education about periods and stuff but the girls were taken away from the boys you know it, and it was taught separately and I just think anyway like, I, it's funny you say that I know of a guy who was you know the way in physio like obviously your physiotherapy undergrad had did it have a small amount of pelvic health did I it, think did in you the specialize? three year full time course it had about five days like it was okay. so because I remember just a story, and this was a secondhand story. He didn't tell me the story, <laughs> but basically he arrived into an elective that he thought was something. And he sort of arrived in, he sort of panicked. He was like, there was 13 girls there. There was no men or whatever, many were there. And he says, what the hell? And he sort of sat down and everyone looked at him like he was, like, what is he doing in this in this lecture? And it turns out it was the elective for pelvic health. So he, you know, he he sort of wandered into it but like he was up and out and he it almost was like he wasn't welcome there so it is still that I suppose that segregation which shouldn't be there and you know it's still you know we're saying oh you know it's hard for the public to talk about it it's still hard for professionals to talk about it like when I was in the um London teaching hospital which wasn't that long ago like well relatively recently and even then I remember doing an in-service training on coccyx pain so on the tailbone, but it was because the physios in the department didn't want to treat tailbone pain because of this whole kind of taboo and embarrassment, you know, around it. And I just thought, oh my gosh, like if if you as a physio or, you know, as a healthcare professional can't talk about it, then how do we expect the people coming to see us? You know, it's yeah. like, it's just so entrenched, like in, in everyone, you know, it is, it is a tricky, tricky area. And you are, I have to say, you're Instagram page is unlike like the information that you you know put out there just of your own volition like even I don't know where you have the time but you're the content and the information I don't think there is a female in my life that I haven't directed to your Instagram <laughs> page because there's so much information there you know about um just again and it's breaking down taboos you're talking about things that people are embarrassed to talk about and you do it with a smile on your face <laughs> and it's you break it down so simply you get rid of anything with a smile on your yeah, face <laughs> for sure <laughs> Gut health doesn't have to be complicated. That's why fibre is your gut's best friend. Keep your body running smoothly with Fibre 89, Circle of Light's delicious range of soluble fibre drinks. Available at all good supermarkets, pharmacies and health food stores. Or find us online at circleoflight.ie. And even I know, like I asked that question, like why is it so hard to get information? But I do, and I know from the work you do with UMI, which I might get you to explain to us what that is, but I know that that is, that's one of your goals is to 
to make sure that every female has access to this information. So even you might just give us a bit of information on UMI Health. Yeah, so it was a passion project that we started, well, that we launched just over a year ago. Um, so it's me, a doctor and an exercise trainer. Um, so we launched it and and that is essentially our goal. Is So it's to get pelvic health information to every woman everywhere. Um, and to the point that our core course, so, well, on the platform, so it's all pelvic health related, but we have courses, which are like lots of video clips of great nugget sized pieces of information that you can take tips away from and like really easy to implement things you can do straight away so we have online courses we have webinars that come out every month we have ebooks that come out every month as well we have a blog we've got loads going on on there but we really do believe that women deserve to know this information um which is why we made our kind of foundation course which is called essentials free so you can go to umi-health.com and sign up for free and it basically in there like that is the module that we wish women well and men but you know that we wish people were taught at school so we have a module on on everything that's kind of taboo as in like periods and pooing and weeing and pelvic floor and breathing and the core and you know we just want to somehow get some information out there as widely as possible because I just I don't know like if there are no stats on it there's no research on it but I just really wonder if people knew even just really simple things like how their breathing affects the pelvic floor or how we toilet and how that affects the pelvic floor I just can't help but think it would just massively reduce rates of incontinence when we kind of get older mm -hmm. you know oh, there are loads of things like yeah. hysterectomy surgery like loads of things I think it could really help to prevent and reduce um, and this whole kind of stereotype that you know as you get older you just end up leaking and you know when you're just at, accepting it yeah as, as normal yeah, yeah. yeah and yeah. I think I know you would all you've said this as well to me it's things leaking or you know it's really common but it's not normal so don't accept it and go seek treatment this is it and and it goes for kind of anyone really at any stage in their life that actually it's never too early or too late to get help so you know I see women who might just as and I say that just as in like relative terms but they might just leak with exercise and think oh it's no big deal I can deal with it I put in a like a liner or a pad or whatever when I'm exercising then it's fine I just carry on but it's never too early to get help like no leak or problem is too small to address now and if you address it while it's small then you will address it quicker than if you leave it to get big or to get worse and actually on the reverse of that no problem is ever too big to get help either yes it might take a little bit more time but like our pelvic floor muscles are like any other muscle you can train them to get stronger and function better and yeah like it's never too early or too late so and does that go as well for a prolapse so if people someone feels like they have that heaviness or they have been diagnosed you know by the medical community by their gp or whatever it is with a prolapse yeah. is that something that can be rectified or you know fixed with physiotherapy very often it can be so unless it's very severe and by that I mean kind of the organ is very visible externally so I would really hope people get help a long time for that um, but the main symptom of a prolapse is a bulging sensation in the vagina so if you have that sensation and bearing in mind that there are lots of sensations that happen vaginally or around the back passage that can be relatively normal you know once we've had a baby it can feel quite bulgy and swollen everything else you know for a good few weeks um like different times of the month so just before we have our period it can feel a bit more heavy and things like that and and those things don't necessarily mean you have a prolapse um but but yeah just I guess a little recap in case people are wondering um but a prolapse generally can really 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 be helped by pelvic health physiotherapy um or simply just by doing your pelvic floor squeezes you know if you look back to those nice guidelines i mentioned a, a bit earlier they have one on prolapse and the main line of attack if you like in terms of treatment is pelvic health physiotherapy because it's proven to work so well you know it's so kind of researched and cost effective and it takes a few months of doing your squeezes so you have to do your squeezes every day for at least four months um, and I would say depending on the extent of symptoms it can take anywhere from four to six months sometimes up to a year depending on like what people's baseline are like and I think with pelvic floor squeezes 
the, I think, and I know this and I laugh with all my friends, as soon as you start talking about it, everyone's doing them. <laughs> yeah. But the problem is no one's doing them, you know, the other six days of the week. So it's something, there is such, there, I don't know what it is about them. They're an annoying exercise to do because like sometimes I say, I'd rather go in and lift a heavy bar than concentrate for those few minutes to do them. Like, again, I'll ask you, you know, what should every female be able to do, you know, outside of pregnancy, just, you know, what what's the goal? And I think it was probably more than likely it was yourself that told me, you know, the goal was to be able to do X amount in standing. And I remember, and it was the holes, the holes, I just find that they're the hardest, you know, like to hold for 10 seconds. And postpartum, it took a long time until I got to the stage that I could confidently do, you know, so for the couple of months postpartum and you get frustrated with them and then you don't do them, yeah. which is totally, yeah, I mean, yeah. it, it should tell you, you need to do them more. But I suppose the message I think that is so important to get out there, it's it's small efforts, you know, on a daily basis. You really do see the results. This is it, exactly that. And I would say that's the most common um, thing that's missing. So when women come to me with pelvic floor stuff, very, very often they don't progress into standing. So they do their squeeze as well when they're like laying in bed before going to sleep maybe or sitting down like if they're, I don't know, caught at a red light or something in the car. They do them, they kind of get that in their routine and their habits, but then it's getting them into standing. And I guess it's maybe because we don't really stand still that often. You know, if we're upright, it's because we're going somewhere or doing something. I suppose brushing but, your teeth or yes. washing dishes is probably, yeah. or washing your hands. Yeah, it's good. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So it's just about real, like, habit stacking them together so that you're always doing them. So I try to do mine when I brush my teeth because it's twice a day, I'm standing, it's not, you know, weekday, weekend, wherever I am, I'm, I'm brushing my teeth, so. And if you were someone who has been slack or, you know, who hasn't really been good for doing your pelvic squeezes, no matter what age you are, would your advice be, so start sitting, start lying? Start lying, yeah. So lying is the easiest because you've got less gravity and then sitting is a bit harder than lying and then standing is harder than sitting. So okay. lying, then sitting, then standing. So do you nail them lying down that you're able to do? So what's the goal yeah. before you progress? It, well, I would say if you haven't got any symptoms or anything at all, then you want to be able to easily do five short squeezes where you squeeze your pelvic floor and let go again straight away. And just a reminder that the let go is as important as the squeeze because um, you really need to make sure that the muscles are staying flexible as well as strong. That's an excellent point. Even can you explain why having tight pelvic floor muscles yeah. is as debilitating as weak muscles? Yeah, it very simply it's because when they are really tense, they then become weak. It's a bit like imagine if you had your hand clenching a fist the whole time like you can kind of still use your hand a bit but you can't really use your hand to your full ability and un unless you've got full flexibility mm -hmm. um and it's the same with any muscle in the body you know if you were like if your arm was constantly bent or you know like it yeah if you do if you can't fully relax a muscle you can't get 100 percent maximal contraction from it so exactly and you can't pick up your wine you know you can't do what you need <laughs> to do <very> important. <laughs> with your hands if it's constantly clenched and and it's the same for the pelvic floor if it's constantly clenched yeah. then if it's very very clenched and you can have pain and things like that that and you might find it really hard to like you can have constipation so I see some women who come to me who think they have constipation and actually what they have is obstructed defecation so it means the pelvic floor can't relax to allow the stool to exit you know so that can happen you can have problems with sex you can have problems with tampons or cups and you know there's there's lots of things that could be a sign that your pelvic floor is tight but if the pelvic floor is tight or tense then it essentially gives you the same problems if it were weak as well and if you're not able to consciously relax, so I do remember actually postnatally, I, in order to make sure that I relax between my squeezes, I think you had said to me, you need to take a big deep breath in between because I wasn't fully relaxing. So but if you're talking about someone who's chronically tight, it does that require a treatment or therapy as such? Yeah, like I would say if you just want to be conscious of relaxing your pelvic floor, then the best, most simple thing to do is just take a big deep breath in, in between every single squeeze, because I think some people can overcomplicate the pelvic floor and it really needn't be. So, you know, if you're going to do five squeezes, just squeeze from the back passage like you're stopping wind, let go again, take a big breath in, breathe out and repeat that five times. And that's fine for your eye. I don't really have any problems or anything like that. But for someone who might have a long standing 
tension or stiffness there, then that will likely still help a bit. But by doing the squeezes, it can sometimes then add to tension rather than actually keeping it flexible. So then in those cases, then yes, they probably do need treatment. Um, but I would say like for those people who do need help with their pelvic floor, if it's really tense, treatment can be quite quick. You know, I don't like everybody's different and, and is an individual, of course. But, you know, normally I'd see someone for maybe once a week for just a few weeks to get things kind of moving again. And then there's loads you can do at home as well, like the breathing, like the squeezing, if you can relax fully. But sometimes that can take a little while. But the breathing is really important. Now I'm going to jump in there. You have said breathing is really important a few times today. So everyone's probably thinking, I always breathe. What do you mean specifically when you say the breathing is important for your pelvic floor? So specifically with our diaphragm, because you're right, everybody breathes and we don't normally think about how we breathe. And it's amazing to think that we can train ourselves out of breathing with our diaphragm without even realizing. Um, so the diaphragm is the main breathing muscle. And when we're just sitting at rest like now, we should be using the diaphragm without even having to think about it. And basically, if you are using your diaphragm, because it's the lid to the core, then as you breathe in, the diaphragm goes down because you're making space for the air to come in. So the diaphragm goes down and then that helps the pelvic floor to then do the same. To relax. To relax, exactly. And then, so if you're not really using your diaphragm, so most commonly, if you're not using your diaphragm, you're, you'd be using kind of like your neck and shoulder muscles to breathe. And if you're not using the diaphragm, then it means the pelvic floor is kind of permanently a bit up or what might also feel like a bit stiff. So you're not getting that flexibility that you require. Exactly, because we need to kind of really think about our pelvic floor like a really strong trampoline. Mm -hmm. You know, the pelvic floor is not like a cork. Like when I see people who have leaking or prolapse symptoms, they instinctively will clench everything. And that can lead to stiffness, which can then actually make the problem worse. And what they need to do, which feels very uh, like alien, is to let the pelvic floor go in order to get their symptoms better. But that can be really hard to do. So then the main thing that I would target often first is the breathing, because then you're taking the focus away from the pelvic floor, away from the symptoms, and you're just thinking about the breathing. And if you're listening to thinking, well, how do I breathe like that then? Um, it's really, really easy. So you just have to take a breath in so that your waist expands. So just literally putting your hands on your hips or just above your hips and breathe in and feel that space between your hands expanding. Like it's it's that simple, it's that boring and that easy. Yeah. And I suppose it's one of those, it's another reason why if you are someone who constantly holds in your tummy, you're not going to be able to breathe correctly. Oh, linked, is it? And so that's why breathing with the diaphragm is linked to so many other things as well. So it really helps get us out of the stress response. It helps our digestion. It like helps lower back pain. Like it, it helps our sleep. Even oh. with regard to going to the toilet as, as well. And I think I was having this conversation with you again. I said, my friends speak to me about all sorts of issues and, you know, constipation. And but this was to do with children. And again, it was the child was holding their breath on the toilet and really straining. And obviously, apart from the damage that that's doing to their pelvic floor, you know, you were, you were trying to say, like, how do, you, how do you teach a child that? Is there any cues or tips? Yeah, well, I think one of the best things is all kids learn by what they see. And I don't know about you, but I don't think I've had a like a toilet on my own for a long time already. Um, Welcome to motherhood. <laughs> I know. So I think like it's a really good idea to like demonstrate, you know, if they're there, like I wouldn't really drag him in if he's not interested, but you know. Of course, yeah. I, I think mm. it can help in terms of just like they'll mimic what they see. Yeah. Um, but then I think just like talking to them about it, like when they bring it up or, or when they're going for the toilet or when, you know, they need supervision for ages, don't they? Like it's yes. not for a good few years that yeah. they're I like. I suppose encouraging them to relax if you do see them. Yeah, this straining. Is yeah. This is it. And you can get like, uh, so the two main things when you're going for a poo that are really crucial for the for pelvic floor is to breathe with your tummy so do that diaphragmatic breathing but then also get your knees up so like when you say your knees up to what height are you talking to get your knees higher than your hips because you're basically just trying to mimic a squat position on the toilet so like you won't find a toilet in my house without a stool next to it there's a there's a poo stool in every bathroom um but then i think for kids they need to have a really high one um so there's there is a well-known brand called potty squatted no, I think that's really important because squatty. I know a lot of a lot of families with toddlers will have a little step 
just to help them get up onto the toilet or to help them with the brushing their teeth. Yeah. So, or even just to be able to wash their hands. But you're right, a lot of those steps, and there's a standard step that comes from Ikea. Yeah. That, <laughs> I know it. It's not, it's not, it's perfect for an adult. Absolutely perfect for an adult, but it's not high enough for children. So that is, what, so what is the name of the brand? Squatty Potty. Squatty what Potty. I, I think it's Potty Squatty. Yeah. Squatty Potty. Okay. Um, and it's the right height for a child. Well, they have oh. adult and children ones as well. So I think the children one is like, an animal shape as well okay. but like the point is it's a lot higher so I think it has like two or three steps within the step to help them get up but then also help to keep their knees higher than their okay. hips so get their um, knees higher than their hips and teach them to breathe into their belly so that their belly rises and falls yeah. exactly and then I think which we probably hardly ever do but is the other thing that's really crucial is to take your time so it's normal to take up to 10 minutes to poo but well, I That's, don't know who's got 10 minutes. Yeah, but. but you know what? And even, again, I've had these conversations with friends because I pass on. I'm really, I'm that really annoying <laughs> friend who gets a piece of information. I love it. And I share it with everyone. Who, everyone needs to hear this information because I think this will make their life better. But that's the, they all come back with that. They're like 10 minutes. First of all, if they're in work, you know what I mean? They yeah. feel it's inappropriate to disappear for that length of time. And as you said, there's that element of toilet shyness, embarrassment, or everyone will know if I was gone for that long, or if you're in a cafe or a restaurant and you disappear yeah. from the table for that long. So again, there's that stigma around toilet habits. Exactly, exactly. But then I think if we're, well, when we're at home with our kids, I think like if we can pass on some of that kind of take your time to like attitude to them there, then I think it can help. But but you're right, you know, it's like, it's so hard in real life to always achieve that. It's If you're, especially, yeah, if you're not at home, it is, it is difficult. But yeah, there's, again, they're the things that we need to get rid of those pre, you know, those taboo things that we need to, to normalize. To come out loud and proud, said, yeah, I just pooed. <laughs> <laughs> loud and <Yeah>. proud <laughs> uh, something actually I, I'm conscious when you said something about UMI health and you were talking about courses and I think it's really important to go back courses might sound a bit academic or like it's yeah. a college course so someone would be like oh I'd love to do that course but I'm a full time mom I don't have time to do a course it's not a course is probably could be off putting for some people yeah so, it's a good point yeah. yeah just I'm conscious of that because I, I know the content you have is phenomenal it's really di digestible easily and I just think yeah, it's important to point out it's not it's not like signing up for a course in computer programming or yeah you know, no no, 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 no. Yeah. It's just basically, I guess the best way to think of it is like an Instagram, like, like TV type thing, but broken down into like sections. Yeah, you know? is so it something like, you could have on your iPad, you're cooking dinner, or you could stick your definitely. earphones in, even drive in the car, you could listen. You could listen to yeah. them. You don't have to watch them. Yeah. So you can just have us on audio. Yeah. Um, but and you can just kind of pick it up and drop it off like whenever you want. You know, I think like if you binge watch essentials, it's something like 70 minutes or something, you know, okay. it's. So all in one go, it's it's not too long, but that's that has like eight modules in it. So it's it's really broken down, you know, and you don't have to watch. And then within each module, there's different clips as well. And is that a good place to start? So if someone's interested and they're yeah, like, yeah. okay, what is this? It's free, isn't it? You can to download, yeah. Yeah, it's totally free. And then we have other courses or bundles or packs, whatever yeah. you want to call them, um, that kind of build on top of that. So like, for example, in our postnatal pack or our pregnancy pack, and we're actually releasing menopause and run um, soon as well. But so they, one for menopause and one for running, is it? One for running, yeah. Amazing. Circle of Light Unroasted Green Coffee. A delicious new taste filled with the goodness of the unroasted green coffee bean, rich in prebiotic fibre for a happy gut. You only get one heart. Show it some love with Circle of Light Unroasted Green Coffee. That, and you know, I actually, I want to ask you about menopause as well, just so we'll go back to that. But that's, that is hugely important. The, inf, the lack of information out there for people who are going through that stage is, is frightening. I know. This is, well, this is why we were so keen to get it out there, because it's another, it's another area that's just like, you're, you know, you find yourself within menopause and then you're like, what the hell is this? And it's so hard to get information. And yeah. yeah, and that's the reason actually, like in our menopause course, we have a whole module on what to know in your 30s, what to know in your 40s and what to know in your 50s, because there's this whole conception again, that like menopause is just for kind of older women. Completely. And actually, 
the average age of menopause, which is, so menopause is literally just when you haven't had a period for one year. So the average age to not have had a period for a year is at 51. I suppose the terminology is the issue. So people talk about going through the menopause. How would you define that? So being menopausal or going through the menopause basically happens before that. So that year anniversary of no period is on average is 51 years old. So after that day, you're then postmenopausal. So you have been through the menopause when you've had that one year anniversary. Anything before that is when you are going through it. So you're you are menopausal. So just purely by definition, it's completely normal to be menopausal in our 40s. And some earlier as well. And I know a number of people who have been very frustrated because they were dismissed as you no, know, you know, you're sitting in front of, you know, they're gone, they're concerned, they have symptoms and you know their life has become more difficult. To to manage because of the symptoms and their worries and concerns were kind of dismissed because of their age. So there was, no, you can't be menopausal because you're only 40 or you're 39. Whereas everyone really is different. So some people could be experiencing those symptoms as early as late 30s. A hundred percent. And that's the thing, like the, the perimenopause, so that period of time before that menopause can be up to like 12 years long. So by definition, again, on average, it, it might start at, in your late 30s, like at 39. And doesn't mean you're then going to have symptoms solidly for 12 years. But the first kind of small signs of it can definitely happen then. And there's body changes that happen in our 30s that may not always be noticeable. But, you know, the menopause is a very gradual thing that happens. I think, again, the more that's known about, the more it's talked about, the better. Because our 40s is not obviously old. And so it's normal to be be menopausal in our 40s. So I think, yeah, we'll see more information. It's another conversation, yeah, that needs to be brought to the fore. And again, another, yeah, a lot of issues or a lot of women's health issues there really is a lot of taboo around them so this is it and then even yeah. when you when you get by the time you get to 50 if we talk about leaking for example so one in two women will have bladder leaks by the age of 50 and one in five women will have bowel leaks by the age of 50 and i just think that that could be like completely obliterated if we just knew a bit more about pelvic health before that point um because because well around the menopause time there is kind of a blip in pelvic health that can happen if our pelvic health isn't optimal so you know if you've been kind of like living life on the edge in terms of like not doing your squeezes (laughs) not doing your squeezes and like squatty potty (laughs) no squatty potty then you know you might have got away with things but often the menopause is when I then see people in clinic as well because and that's what scared me actually that is what made me like stopped me exercising you know post Italy is that 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 threat that if you don't look after your pelvic floor now you could regret it you know and more than likely will regret it when you hit menopause yeah definitely and it's just it's not an inevitability it doesn't mean you will have problems when you are menopausal but it's just another thing that can contribute to pelvic health symptoms or pelvic floor symptoms so if you have another if you have other risk factors it can just kind of be the the tipping point but again it it can still be helped it can still be changed it doesn't mean you have to live like that but that was going to be my next question so if you are in your 50s or you know you're through the menopause and you are one of those you know that those statistics that you are leaking is it and it's funny I've had conversations with women and they've spoke to me about these issues and they've just accepted that this is just I, I have a weak pelvic floor but is that something you would say that can even at that stage in life it can be rectified a hundred percent it doesn't matter that's a really important message yeah definitely like I had a lady maybe a year and a half two years ago and she was 87 and I was seeing her for a prolapse and I saw her about six months and then she walked away without any symptoms at all you know it it is completely possible no matter what your age no matter how bad you think things are to make things better like it's it's always possible to get better Always. That's amazing. And that's a really key message, I think, to get out there. If you're of any symptoms or any concerns, seek help. And as you said, there's no such thing as too early. No, this is it. And I think that's one of the things I love about Umi that because I do realise the whole embarrassment thing is still there, that actually, if you have any trouble at all, go to Umi first, do start doing your squeezes and then go from there. You know, you're already one step closer then to to making things better for yourself. So and I'm backtracking slightly um, something we before we left the exercise topic and the reference to putting pressure on your pelvic floor yeah. and again I know I keep referencing myself my experience with you but you I suppose brought it to my attention that when you're lifting heavy very often and again most people who you know lift weights will be familiar with the term bracing mm-hmm. and 
wearing a belt. So say, for example, if you're going for a one rep max or, you're, you know, you're lifting a really heavy weight, some people might wear a weightlifting belt. And even like a weight, I've heard you say this before, you know, like the fact that you pull it as tight as you possibly can. Do you want to explain, like, what's your take, what's your stance on that bracing in exercise and wearing the weightlifting belts? Well, knowing everything I know, and I'm also a CrossFit um, qualified trainer so I don't actually teach classes but I just use it to help me with my clients and stuff um, and I love CrossFit too so you know and you're very good at it can nerdy. I add <laughs> <laughs> I don't know about now uh, it's been a while but um, yeah so knowing everything I know I have never and would never use a belt when I'm lifting any weights and uh, again like because all of research is very male dominant and we need to kind of give some love to our ladies in terms of what we, what gets looked at and what's get researched and everything else. But as of yet, there is no research behind using belts and the long-term effects on the pelvic floor. But what, I, what we do know is that weightlifting techniques and breathing and bracing and belts, they were all kind of taught with men in mind because if you look back and not that long ago, like 100 years ago or so, you know, even while well, looking at the start of the Olympics, like women weren't allowed to compete. And when we did eventually get allowed to compete we could only do like tennis and golf you know like weightlifting is is designed for men and then women have just been taught the same techniques as men obviously men have pelvic floor too and their pelvic floor can go awry but when we lift any amount of weight so whether that's in the kitchen or in the gym when we lift anything our intra-abdominal pressure increases so that pressure within the tummy or within the the core so you've got an increase in pressure and any time that pressure increases, our pelvic floor muscles have to match it because they're at the bottom of the core and they have to be able to respond. So they have to have enough strength. They have to squeeze in the right way. They have to be strong enough and hold on long enough to cushion all of that pressure. So the heavier that we lift, the more pressure there is going down. And then if we hold our breath or brace, then that increases our intra-abdominal pressure again. And then if we're wearing a belt, and especially a tight belt around the middle, then that is just squeezing and pushing down. It's a bit like an extreme form of that pulling the tummy in. Yeah, of course. So you're like really like squishing the space in that core cylinder a lot more. And that is just really heightening intra-abdominal pressure even more. So adding all those things together, and some women will lift like that and have no problems at all. And that's completely their choice. Um, I just wonder how much of it is an informed choice. Because when I ask people in the gym or ask coaches, you know, oh, why, you know, why do you train like that? Or why do you teach that? Or why do you lift like that? And I am genuinely interested because I, I want to know their reasons because I came to CrossFit relatively recently about six, or seven years ago. So I was, I was already well into pelvic health before CrossFit. And it's just really interesting. Like a lot of people use belts just because they're taught to. You know, they're not really they're not really consciously thinking about it. Um, so people and who they, go they to believe gym, it helps. I think I don't think it, they have. It's even they have contemplated that it could be doing harm. No, and again, exactly. until you told me, it never dawned on me. Yeah, 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 exactly. And and maybe it won't do harm, but just kind of knowing what I know and pressure and forces and power floor, I just can't see how it. I anyway, know I'm not. It's not for me to say, but I do think it can be helpful if you're having any power floor problems to ditch the belt, even just temporarily, until your power floor is stronger again, and then go back to it if you want to. Because the other the other big reason is people can sometimes think it helps protect their back, and I just think. If you didn't wear the belt and you get your muscles strong, your muscles will protect your back. And then you don't need the belt either for that. You know, it's kind of, yeah. And I suppose the bracing, a lot of people are probably thinking, well, how would you squat or how would you deadlift heavy without bracing? Yeah. So, and this, I asked you this question, and this, I, I still always, I and mean, I quote you on this, you blew my mind that day. I was like, you mean you never brace? Like, I couldn't understand that. And I was like, but what do you do? And like, how do you create that intra-abdominal pressure without bracing? Yeah. And you can, what was the simple answer? Well, it, your body just does it automatically. Like, I don't, yeah, I, I never brace either. Um, but it's and, the contraction of the pelvic floor. That was the one thing you told me. Yeah, 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 like yeah. Before you lift, it's not a brace. The contraction of the pelvic floor. Yeah, so just a very gentle kind of activation. So you don't want like a full squeeze as hard as you can. Um, but it's a gentle activation. And sometimes I don't even think about that, you know, because it, it should become automatic. Like 
we shouldn't have to think every single time about and how we're lifting. I suppose that was, I was retraining postnatally so that yeah. I needed to actually, my pelvic floor didn't automatically do it. Yeah, and so, that's, yeah, that that's so, so common postnatally. So yeah, I would really recommend doing that for at least a few weeks or sometimes a few months when you've had a baby to really consciously activate the sequence consciously rather than kind of relying on automatic functions. So before you lift the weight, consciously you know, contract your pelvic floor and yeah. then eventually it will become automatic again. Exactly. And if you are having any trouble or like with your pelvic floor or if you are postnatal, the other, another top tip is to breathe out as you lift. Um, so obviously when you're bracing, you're breathing in and holding your breath and sometimes pushing out. But if you breathe out when you lift, it actually helps to decrease excessive pressure. And there was a study a little while ago now, actually about five years ago, that came out and they were looking at basically force production. So how much you could lift and they were comparing it to different breathing techniques. And so they had three different breathing techniques. They had breathing in, hold your breath and lift, breathe out, hold your breath and then lift. And the third one was breathe in and then out as you lift. And the study basically showed that everybody lifted exactly the same weight, no matter how much they breathed. So actually, it showed that bracing doesn't necessarily make you lift heavier. But really importantly, they also showed that when you breathe in and then breathe out as you lift, the intra-abdominal pressure was significantly less than the other breathing techniques. So, I, so protecting your pelvic floor. Yeah, I just yeah. kind of think, okay, you're maybe, maybe not. And I'm sure some people would lift heavier if they were bracing, if they're used to bracing. Yeah, of but course. generally, if it's not going to make yeah. you lift heavier yeah. and actually by breathing out, it helps your pelvic yeah. floor. That would be I my option. And I guess for the general population that aren't competing, it's not competition. Yeah, 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 yeah exactly, exactly. Yeah, yeah, it's would, and it's quite a controversial, um, it you know, stance. <laughs> and I've, you know, I've seen and witnessed debates about it. So yeah, but it's so interesting. You know, I think, I mean, you are supporting it with the research and, yeah. you know, you have the expertise. So I've, I've taken what you said on board and it, yeah, I think it's, it's something that's really important message to get out there. As you said, people are using belts and they're bracing, but is it an informed choice or are they doing it because they think that's what you do or that's what I have to do? Yeah, because yeah. it's interesting as well, because going to different CrossFit gyms, for example, because that's where I first came across the weightlifting belt was in a CrossFit gym. And different gyms, like you have like kind of mini cultures within the gym. So like the first one I went to, nobody really used the belt. And then when I came over here, the one I was at for quite a while, lots of people used the belts. You know, it was like, you don't lift without the belt. And it's like, it's just it's just so interesting. Like, as you say, like maybe people are just using it because they think that's what you do. And 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 it's also hard to, you know, we're, we're humans, you know, like it's hard to be the one to say, oh, no, I'm not going to use the belt. Yeah, completely. Helen, I could talk to you for another two hours. You have so much important information to share. And that's why we are absolutely delighted to have you on board as Scientific Advisor with Circle of Light. I have personally have completely absorbed your passion for this area. And I admire so much how selfish you are with your time and energy in your pursuit to help people and remove the taboo around this space. So thank you so much. Thank you. It was great chatting to you. It's a pleasure. So thank you so much. Thank you. Thanks for tuning in to The Natural Health Revolution. We hope you have come away more informed and empowered to make little adjustments towards a happier, healthier way of life. We are dedicated to spreading the message of natural health and we hope that if you enjoyed this episode, you will join us again for more experts and insights from the fields of health, nutrition and well-being. We would love to hear from you. So if you have any questions or want to know more about us, you can find us online at circleoflight.ie and on all social media platforms.